I'm Tom Stabline. I am uh, one of the sponsors of this event and pay for the food. Well, I don't. The university does. But, you know, um, so uh, you thank you for the food. Though. Yeah. Re the reason I do is because we have a master's program at USF and um, it's fully uh, remote, but it's live instruction. So if you want to learn data analytics, data science, and you're on the, typically on the business side, or maybe in IT, and uh, and you want those credentials. It's a STEM program, so unlike an MBA, you know it's uh, it's um, I would call it more rigorous, and I could say that because I have an MBA, but um, a lot more rigorous. And uh, it's no longer the business analytics and information systems degree. We've changed it this fall. It is now the artificial intelligence and business analytics masters of science. So, and anybody has any questions, chat over here, just graduated. This, uh, yeah. this got his uh, official role as data scientist. He told me down at SOCOM, so that's great. Anybody else here in the program or, no? Usually we have a few people uh, come. Um, so anyhow, who? Yeah. Yeah, hey. <laughs> so please, uh, you know, talk, get, get with me if you have any interest at all. Or Dana, oh, and there's some brochures again. New name for the program. We added, of course, machine learning, and, and things are more AI focused now. Uh, it's all you know, developments around all ends. So I don't want to take any more time from David, who uh, again has been coming for uh, about a year to these to these meetings and volunteered to to talk about a unique topic that we uh, you know I'm very interested. In. <laughs> yeah, how this goes. I'm excited. So again, anybody have any? Any questions before we start? <laughs> All right. So I'm going to try and wrap this up by around 7 or 7.05. Leave 10 to 15 minutes for questions. So if you have like, a, you know, kind of like a, a riff sort of further reading question, like what about generative AI? Let's save it for that 10 to 15 minute block. Um, I am going to be talking about some stuff that's a little bit technical. So if there's something that you don't understand or you think I made a mistake or something, feel free to raise your hand. And we'll, we'll try and get that addressed because they do want you to, to at least follow along what's what's happening. Um, but um, by the way, so if any of you have devices, uh, feel free to scan. Uh, there'll be a couple of different QR codes that you can follow along if you want. You don't have to. Um, I'll you know try and uh, you know kind of get a link uh, to this presentation out to you all afterwards. Um, so you can feel free to look up the GitHub afterwards if you want to dive a little bit deeper. But yeah, feel free to scan the code. This one is for the GitHub repo. Like I said, you don't have to, to follow along with this. Um, it's kind of a, a not designed uh, that you need to, but it is there if you, you kind of want to uh, dig in a little deeper. Can we be willing to put that link on the meetup? Announcement? Yes, I will send that along to Dana uh, and uh, hopefully get it, all, get it all out to you. And so yeah, there's some, there's some data uh, there as well. So a little bit about me, um, I got my math uh, degree from FIU down in Miami, got my master's in data science uh, from New College of Florida down in Sarasota. I had no idea that USF had a program like this at the time, uh, but uh, but yeah, New College uh, was kind of, my, I went there for a little bit for undergrad as well, so it kind of made sense to go back. Uh, I have a background in education. I was a tutor, I was a teacher. I taught um, uh, the science of roller skating at a couple of roller skating rinks in Tampa. So kind of a long history of sort of teaching and in education. Uh, after I got my degree in data science, I worked for a few years uh, for a company doing ecosystems restoration, these drones to plant trees. And so I was working on uh, image classification models to detect invasive species and things like that. Um, and then more recently, I worked uh, in, uh, in ed tech uh, for a test prep company doing knowledge tracing, very similar to the kind of stuff that we're gonna be talking about today. Um, so I like to kind of work on projects where I can make a little, make a difference. Uh, I've just started a role uh, for a defense contractor um, doing stuff that I can't really talk about, but uh, hopefully is, is uh, making us all a little bit safer. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about me. Feel free to connect on LinkedIn uh, afterwards and uh, you know we can chat afterwards and, and scan QR codes and all that good stuff. So I want to kind of motivate this a little bit. You know, there were there were a few kind of questions in my mind either that were kind of I wanted to answer and I wanted you to come away with the answers with uh, from this talk. Um, you know, uh, one of those is if you're studying for a test, you know, people spend a lot of money on test prep courses for um, things like LSAT, MCAT, GMAT, uh, in this kind of postgraduate testing. And, um, you know, I wanted to really answer the question, is it even worth your time? Is it worth the money? 
Uh, should you actually take the test? Uh, you know, should you spend the money on the test prep? And what does your score actually mean? So, you know, uh, if you you and your buddy get a slightly different score, does that mean that they did better than you? Um, so I want to kind of make this formal and talk about uh, this in terms of confidence intervals from statistics. So if you have a little bit of a statistics background, that's great. But if not, we'll, we'll kind of talk about it a little bit. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about two PL models or two parameter logistic models. Um, we're going to talk about how the standard error measurement of a test uh, decreases with increasing discrimination. These are all terms that we'll, we'll go over. So don't worry if this is a lot of gobbledygook. And we're going to illustrate this uh, with a heuristic. We're going to talk about the number of, uh, of uh, score buckets that a test can sort, sort students into. And uh, we'll kind of apply that to uh, talk about some specific tests uh, like the LSAT and the GMAT. And then, you know, talk a little bit about what that means for building supervised learning models, machine learning models that predict uh, students' test scores from historical scores. So we'll, we'll get into all that. So a little bit of a disclaimer, um, this is kind of a specialized area, item response theory or psychometrics. Uh, you can get your PhD in this from USF. So if you don't wanna go the business analytics route, there's I think a degree, a PhD degree offered by the psychology department at USF called something like a measurement and evaluation. So you can get your PhD in these type of models. I do not have a PhD in these type of models. Um, I'm a bit of a, you know, just learned this on the job. So if there is, is there anyone here who is like a psychometrician? Raise your hand if you're, no? Okay. All right, thought, you know, maybe maybe you could help me out a little bit. But um, but yeah, if you do see anything that looks like a mistake, um, feel free to point it out. Um, I'm not perfect. So and I wouldn't mind some sort of general feedback on this presentation afterwards. Uh, just come up and talk to me. So psychometrics is basically the, the kind of statistical field or, or psychology field that is concerned with the design and administration of tests and questionnaires. Uh, so that could be uh, the kind of questionnaire that you take like customer satisfaction survey, it could be a standardized test, it could be something else. Uh, so the historical way that this was done was something called classical test theory. Classical test theory just treats the test as one uh, whole unit of study uh, where you just model your, uh, your true score um, as uh, your observed score on some kind of error. And so classical test theory assumes that all the questions give us the same information about a student's knowledge. Um, and it can't be used to compare two different tests. So if a student gets, uh, you know, one score on their first test and another score on their second attempt, you can't really say whether or not the student improved or not with classical test theory. The other thing about classical test theory is it's sample dependent. So you can't, you can't actually compare two different sets of students on the same test. Um, so uh, in response to those kind of deficiencies, uh, you know, uh, these statisticians developed this thing called item response theory in which the item or the individual question is the unit of study. And there are certain assumptions that you make with IRT that allow you to make, uh, make different kinds of inferences. And those, uh, those assumptions are subject to all sorts of tests. You have to verify that those assumptions hold. Uh, one of the assumptions is, uh, you know, it's not assumed that all questions give you the same information about a student. Um, and so because of that, it's a lot easier to compare different students across different tests um, and see if they improved or not. Okay, so what can you use IRT for? You can compare different students uh, who've taken different tests on a common scale. Uh, you can identify uh, whether or not a question is a good question or which questions are better than others, or which ones give you more information. Uh, you can see which questions are harder than others. When you're sitting down to write a question, you might think it's a really hard question, but it turns out it's really easy or vice versa. So IRT gives you a way to actually see from the data which questions are harder than others. You can, uh, as we'll see, you, you know, there's a statistical model that comes out of this or a machine learning model, if you prefer, and you can use, use that to make predictions uh, to see how will student, certain students answer certain questions. Um, you can also kind of use that to infer missing responses. You know, if a student skipped a question or if someone taking a satisfaction survey skipped a question, you can kind of infer based on their other uh, the answers to their other questions, how they would have answered. Um, and uh, the, the thing that really I want to focus on is uh, IRT actually gives you a way to determine better error bands for a student's score than you can get from classical test theory. So you can really kind of get a sense of, of what the score means. Is there anyone? Yes. Question. So is it fair to say that um, you know, this, this can uh, be generalized to the type of test that you take when you apply for having a job somewhere in a company? What, what kind of job? Place? Analytics, a lot of these folks, so many people are taking the test when they apply for a job, um, you know, any type of coding skills or 
know, analytics skills is uh, so. Yes. Um, so this is getting getting a little bit. I, I want to talk about this a little bit more, kind of at the end. But yes. So you know, I, I just finished a six month job search, and uh, including you know applying to some companies who uh, ed tech companies who really should know better. And I was really shocked at at kind of the awful questions that that people would ask. Uh, it's really just kind of a crapshoot. Sometimes you, you just get lucky and you know the answer, or you know you don't get lucky and you don't know the answer. And this is kind of how they're they're determining you know uh, people who are going to hopefully stay with them for years and really kind of you know uh, deliver on these machine learning projects. So um, yeah, I, I think it is applicable for sure. Um, yes. Is it now? Is it testing skills versus uh, things like? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't think it really distinguishes, right? At the end of the day, it's, um, uh, well, I, I think, I think it'll become clearer once we dig in a little bit deeper. So if you still have this question at the end, feel free to raise your hand again, and we'll, we'll, we'll dive in. But I, I think, I think you'll, you will find out. Uh, so, uh, raise your hand here if you're familiar with logistic regression. Okay, good. Raise your hand if you're not, if you've never seen logistic regression before. Okay, we'll do a quick review. Uh, we're not going to dive in real deep. But uh, IRT is pretty similar to logistic regression, so I think it's it's worth doing a, a little review. So here's uh, the sigmoid function or the logistic function, and uh, here is the formula. Um, and um, uh, you know you can see the upper asymptote here at the top. Oops, and uh, but most important, oh, it doesn't really. Uh, oh, my laser's not working. Anyway, yeah, here here's the upper asymptote, and uh, most importantly, it's a nonlinear function. Um, so just, just, just back up. So it's always got zero at the bottom, and L can be anything at the top. Yes. So it could be a million or two or seven. Or right. Anything. But anything. yes, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Um, so when we're doing, uh, you know, when we're doing IRT, uh, very frequently we're interested in yes or no, so uh, correct or not. Uh, so and uh, we were interested in a probability. Um, and so when we're interested in a probability, uh, you know, we usually have dichotomous data. And so the number on top is going to be a one. And that kind of forces, uh, forces the output to be between zero and one. So, you know, decimal numbers basically, right? Um, so uh, we're interested in dichotomous uh, binary response data, data drawn from a Bernoulli distribution. And we learned the parameters of this logistic function, uh, the beta one and the beta two, um, from the data. Uh, we learn the parameters which best fit the data. Um, and uh, so higher values of uh, the input, uh, the X are going to get you values closer to one, uh, but with a nonlinear increase. And so uh, one of the, some of the things that this is used for is to predict uh, user churn or attrition, whether or not uh, somebody's going to default on their loan, uh, whether you know the probability that a patient is going to get cancer um, from uh, zero and one labeled data. All right, so here's a quick example of how you'd uh, make a prediction with logistic regression. Uh, so let's assume that we have data uh, on loan defaults, where one uh, symbolizes whether or not uh, somebody defaulted on their loan, and zero means that they did not uh, default, at least in that data set. Um, if X is the age of the loan, and we have these numbers here uh, for the intercept and slope parameter, uh, and let's say we have a loan uh, where that's that's been out for five years, uh, you can plug and chug, you put in those parameters here uh, to this function, and you put in five over here, and you get 15%. So they have a 15% uh, uh, probability of uh, defaulting on the loan. Any questions about that? Okay. Oop. All right, so uh, one of the things that I really like about uh, logistic regression is an example of an interpretable model. Uh, and you might have heard a lot these days about explainable AI. So this is uh, you know, arguably an explainable uh, AI model because um, uh, you can actually say um, what a one unit increase in X uh, will correspond to in terms of uh, the odds uh, of, for instance, default. Um, so there's a very clear relationship between inputs and outputs. So uh, even though logistic regression is nonlinear, you can do a transformation uh, to the odd scale um, and you can express that relationship in a linear way. Uh, so, uh, for instance, using the parameters that we just had, for every year that a loan ages, the odds of defaulting would increase by a factor of e to the 0.3 power, or uh, would increase by a factor of 1.3.
Okay, so that's all just logistic regression. So now we're going to talk about IRT stuff, which kind of builds on top of that. So one of the one of the things that um, we model in IRT is uh, a latent trait, uh, which uh, psychometricians usually call theta. So in the case of standardized testing, that's we're usually going to think of that as a student ability or student proficiency, or maybe their knowledge. Um, but it's I prefer ability because at the end of the day, like like you mentioned, right? It could just be test taking ability. We don't we don't really know like is it someone's uh, you know knowledge of you know law or is it just their skill at taking tests. So we, that's all kind of rolled in together here because uh, this is, as we'll talk about in a second, uh, the models that we're dealing with are unidimensional. We aren't only modeling one trait. So the idea, we call it a hidden trait. The idea is that we can't really observe uh, their ability directly, but we infer it from their responses, from you know whether or not they got a uh, question correct or not. And so the theta uh, corresponds to the x-axis in regular old uh, logistic regression. So over here, the x-axis in IRT would be theta or your ability. Uh, and they're, they're it's generally distributed normally, just like test scores. So discrimination corresponds to the slope parameter uh, of a logistic function. Uh, in IRT, we can think of it as uh, the sensitivity of the question to the latent trait. So uh, how, how much uh, the probability will increase uh, if you increase uh, ability by a given amount. Uh, so there are some caveats, but in general, you want discrimination to be as high as possible. Uh, you know, another way that I like to think of that is the noise in the question, right? So the higher the discrimination, the less noise in the question, the more information that you get from that question. So there are some exceptions if your data is really weird, but usually you want it to be as high as possible. And, um, you know, one question that I kind of wanted to answer is, well, you know, how high is high enough? And hopefully we'll, we'll get into that. Um, so these are some uh, plots of different discriminations. And uh, over here, you can notice that a discrimination of zero, uh, you know, students of any ability are equally likely to answer a question correctly. They all have a 50% chance of answering. So hopefully that gives you an idea, right? If you have zero discrimination, your question is completely useless, right? Everybody's gonna have an equal chance, a 50% chance of answering the question correctly. Um, so uh, difficulty is pretty intuitive, right? It does, you know, correspond to what we think of as the difficulty of a question, at least with regards to things like academic tests. Um, you know, if you're talking about maybe a questionnaire like a, a customer satisfaction survey, maybe maybe it's a little bit harder to interpret. Yes. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Am I adjusting the? By adjusting the bias and the variance with the theta value, so uh, no, it's it's just depends on the on the question. So the question parameters are like in a sense independent of the theta, right? Now they are fit based on you know the data, right? So a given data set of students, they're going to have a certain ability, and based on that ability you know, that does, is going to, in a sense, we're going to use that to determine the item parameters, but it, it should be sample independent, right? So if you just, you know, take another set of samples, you should get parameters, item parameters that are more or less the same. That's that's the assumptions of IRT anyway. Um, so, uh, so yeah, the difficulty corresponds to the intercept uh, of the logistic function. Um, and, uh, you know, you can notice, and actually we'll kind of show you that in a second, that whenever the theta or ability is equal to the difficulty, the probability of answering correctly or getting a one is 50%. Ideally, you want a range of different difficulties so that you can uh, measure a range of different abilities, right? Um, so just, you know, uh, kind of quickly kind of see that, right? Kind of increase this, whoops. Right, so if uh, here A is the discrimination, B is the difficulty. So if uh, theta is equal to B, right? So you have B minus B, that's zero. So this whole exponent here is zero. So e to the zero is one. So one over one plus one is one half, 50%. Um, okay, any, any questions about that? No? How do I get it back to uh, full screen? Real. Okay, so when we fit a uh, two-parameter logistic model, 
we get a logistic curve for every item in the question. So you can kind of think of this as doing logistic regression for every item on the test. But the way that it's different is that you do get these abilities for every student. That's not something you get out of uh, regular logistic regression. Um, and you know the the you're going to get a different set of uh, intercepts and slope parameters for every question in general, right? Because uh, they're going to be different difficulties and have different discriminations. And for every student or respondent or whatever, you're going to get uh, possibly different uh, theta or ability parameter. Um, so, uh, for instance, if you're uh, designing a questionnaire to test whether a respondent is autistic, theta might be a score representing where that respondent lies on the autism spectrum. Um, or like I, I mentioned before, it could be a satisfaction score. Um, okay, so I kind of briefly showed you all this, um, but uh, for those who kind of aren't as familiar, um, there's a little interactive uh, logistic function. And just to kind of show you if we, uh, this is the discrimination, can you all see this? Yeah. So as we change the discrimination parameter, you can see how the slope of the logistic function changes and you could even make it negative. Um, and as we change the difficulty, um, it slides left and right. So that's, that's the logistic function. Okay, so I mentioned before, there are certain assumptions uh, for IRT. Um, one of them is unit dimensionality, uh, meaning that the responses uh, are due to one latent trait. Um, so, you know, in the case of, uh, you know, like for instance, MCAT, right? You're just testing general medical knowledge. You're not necessarily looking at uh, the ability for every individual section on that test, right? So there's like a, there's kind of like a um, sort of logical reasoning section and there's like a biology section and there's the chemistry section. So you're not measuring, measuring those separately. You're just measuring one overall uh, kind of MCAT ability. Um, so there are multidimensional IRT models. That's a whole different ball of wax, which we're not going to get into today. Another assumption is monotonicity, meaning the probability of answering correctly does not decrease with an increase in the latent trait. I mean, that would be kind of weird, right? That would mean that the better a student you are, the less chance you had of getting the question correct, right? So we're kind of assuming that the questions are not that poorly designed. There are implementations that don't make that assumption. Um, and, you know, it, it's a good good thing to check to make sure um, that your questions aren't that bad. Um, but, uh, but yeah, in general, that's, that's the assumption that we make. Um, item variance, uh, item parameters don't change from sample to sample. You want that so that you can, um, you know, uh, use the same model on a different batch of students. And this uh, last one is going to be uh, pretty important for something we're going to discuss later, local independence. So given a particular ability level, right, given a particular student ability, uh, the probability of answering on uh, one question is independent of the probability of answering correctly on a different question. And the questions are independent. So there are different types of IRT models, um, even, you know, given the sort of unidimensionality uni trait, even holding that fixed, there are different types, uh, sort of the very basic uh, IRT models, uh, one parameter model, also called a rash model. Um, and that assumes that the discrimination is always equal to one. Okay, so with two parameter logistic model, which is the one that we're really gonna talk about today, we, we don't make that assumption. The discriminations of all the different items can be different. Uh, there's a three parameter logistic model, which says, hey, you know, students can guess, maybe we should account for that. So they add a guessing parameter. Um, there's been, some kind of research recently that shows that maybe that's not a very good model for different reasons. Um, so some people have introduced a four parameter model to kind of, uh, you know, account for the deficiencies in the three parameter model. So the two parameter model, you focus the picture, you know, so then you can grab in two dimensions. So I assume a three parameter model is sort of the same thing only in other dimensions of space? Or no, no, it, it, it still, it has nothing to do with, with like the dimensional and Euclidean space. It's just, it adds another parameter, um, but it's still, you can still draw, draw a two dimensional plot. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the other models, which one is the most widely used or widely used? I, I think it's the two parameter model. Uh, yeah, which is the one that we're talking about. But you said of the other ones, I'd say the, the rash model, um, that was kind of a, a more of a historical model, but sometimes you start with a rash model and you just see if that's good enough, uh, it's simpler. Um, so that it's possible that you know, sometimes that assumption would hold. Um, yeah. 
Okay, so uh, there are there are a few differences. One of them we've already talked about. Um, sorry, there's some differences between uh, IRT models and regular logistic regression. One of them is that you get these abilities, um, which you don't normally get. You get a different set of parameters for every question. Um, uh, let's see, whatever. Right, okay. Uh, and the other difference is that uh, you'll sometimes see uh, the logistic function parameter parameterized slightly differently. Uh, I kind of showed you that over here. Uh, we basically just kind of factor this term out. Um, so uh, you'll sometimes see it uh, where you have uh, Oops, where you have it like this, right? So where it's it's all um, uh, there's two parameters here on the inside, but it it doesn't really make a difference. It's more just uh, convention. Okay, so on to uh, item information. So item information function, um, it's kind of derived from uh, the discrimination and the item information function. Uh, this is its formula, and this is kind of what the graph looks like. And you can see that as the discrimination uh, increases, uh, you get something that's more and more bell-shaped. Um, there's You'll sometimes see the scaling factor to actually normalize it and so that it is uh, a lot closer to a normal distribution. But in general, it's not without this D parameter. It's just bell-shaped. Um, so again, A here is the item discrimination. And um, you know, for those who remember the calculus, it's uh, just a scalar multiple of the first derivative of the item response function. But um, the idea here is that it tells us how fast uh, the probability increases uh, with increasing theta. Okay, so um, really one of the things that I really kind of wanted to talk about here is the standard error of measurement. The idea with the standard error of measurement is that it gives you a sense of the reliability of the test. And it gives you a sense of what your score means. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, the standard error of measurement um, is uh, really something that is usually thought of as on a test basis, but with IRT, you can actually get a different standard error of, me different standard error of measurement uh, at a given ability level. The idea is that the error in the test um, isn't the same for every student. Right, um, really, uh, really good students uh, might have less error. They might have more error than sort of middling students. Um, so we want to find out uh, what is the standard error at a given ability level, so we can give you uh, a more accurate error band around your score. So Lord uh, Frederick M. Lord, who's the father of IRT, uh, gave this uh, sort of definition for the standard error measurement at a given ability level in his 1984 paper. Um, I want to kind of look at it to sort of understand what it means, right? Um, the standard error is normally an, uh, an estimate of the standard deviation. Um, so uh, an estimate of the score root of the, the variance. And if you look in here, um, this is actually just for those who remember their, their probability or statistics, this is the variance of a Bernoulli random variable. And so the idea is that we're summing this across uh, every item in the test to get the error of the, um, the variance in the number of questions right. Um, and so I've really kind of expanded this down here. Um, really what this is, is the probability, uh, you know, for a particular, that, that a uh, particular student at a particular ability level will get that question correct. Um, so these X I's here are the different items in the test. So um, this here is the probability that uh, the answer will the question will be answered correctly given uh, a student's ability level, and this is the probability that they will get the question wrong. So probability of uh, success times probability probability of failure. That's uh, the variance of a Bernoulli random variable. Um, so you might remember that um, if uh, two random variables are independent, okay, and only if you know they're independent, then um, you can say that the sum of the the sorry the variance of the sum of the random variables is equal to the sum of the variances, um, and so this is where that local independence assumption comes in. Okay, so local independence means at a given ability level, and that's what we have here. Um, and so at a given ability level, uh, the probability of answering correctly is in, uh, on one item is independent of the, the probability of answering correctly on a different item, and so that lets us drop what would normally be another term here of uh, plus two times the covariance of the two random variables. So it kind of simplifies things for us. 
And so what we're doing here, right, is we're actually doing the sum, right? But we're doing it for every item on the test. Um, and so the quantity here in the square root is the total variance of the test at that ability level. So uh, if all that kind of went over your head, don't worry about it. This is basically the formula that we're going to use. Um, I just kind of wanted to give a little bit of background. So I did a little experiment to see, you know, how does uh, accuracy of this classifier vary um, with increasing discrimination and how does the standard error measurement vary with increasing discrimination? Because I really wanted to get across the relationship with, between discrimination and standard error. Um, and so uh, I'll kind of, there's another slide here in a moment, but basically you can see that as uh, the discrimination goes up, the accuracy of the classifier increases. And um, as the discrimination increases, the standard error goes down. Intuitively, that, that makes sense, right? Because more discrimination means more information from each item, okay? So uh, you should be able to measure students' score more accurately. Um, and um, there is, uh, on the GitHub, there is uh, the code notebook that I use to kind of produce these plots. So, but I'll, I'll kind of walk you through how I produce them. Uh, I sampled 2,000 uh, difficulties and 10,000 abilities from, from a normal distribution. Um, so just using a random number generator to just get um, kind of random numbers um, that are normally distributed. And then I sampled 2,000 discriminations from eight different gamma distributions um, so that the, the mean of the distribution was uh, between 0 and 3.5. So that was just kind of a restriction that I made. And you want it to be a gamma distribution because uh, you don't want the discrimination to be negative. In a normal distribution, it can be negative. So I divided the data up then into 9,000 training samples and 1,000 test samples. For each set of discrimination, I fit another 2PL model and I evaluated them on the test abilities and um, you know, to evaluate uh, test accuracy. And then I did something a little bit funny. Um, so what I did was I... Uh, got the standard error measurement at the given uh, ability level for each ability, um, for each of those 10,000 abilities, and then I averaged them to get the overall standard error measurement. The reason that's funny is I'm kind of, I could have done that. If that's all I wanted to do, I could have used classical test theory, right? Because classical test theory just gives you one error uh, for the whole test, uh, regardless of ability level. But uh, I did this because, you know, I wanted to uh, illustrate um, IRT for you and kind of tie these two concepts together. Um, so, uh, but this, and it's easier to kind of show on one plot too, if you have one overall uh, standard error. So you can just plot one point for each sample. Any questions about how I produce these plots? Yeah. Yes. What are the parameters for the accuracy? Um, it, it's, um, you mean like how, what, how did I define accuracy? Yeah, it's just um, the number of, uh, the number of uh, correct predictions over the total number of predictions. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so that was standard error of measurement. Now, since that 1984 paper that Frederick M. Lord wrote, there's been a lot of progress in IRT and they've, to find uh, a, a different version of the standard error measurement at a given ability level. And they call that now the standard error of the estimate, just to differentiate from the older definition. Um, and uh, so what you do is you take those item information functions that we talked about before, you take all those, you add them all up uh, for, every, uh, for every item, and you get something called the test information function. And then you take the score root of that and you divide that into one and that's your standard error of the estimate. Exactly why, you know, that's the way they define it. It's something I'm still trying to kind of grapple with myself. To me, it's still, you know, a little bit funny. Why would you define it that way? But that's how they do it. Um, and so to kind of illustrate this, there's another code notebook uh, where I produced this plot. And what I did this time is instead of uh, using synthetic data, I used some actual uh, IRT data that was published in this paper. Um, and fit a bunch and fit the model and um, got the standard error measurement using this this formula and this is what it looks like and so you can see that uh, it's different for different ability levels right so it's a lowest here kind of around around the middle of the distribution and it increases towards the edge which makes sense in a way I guess the reason they've defined it that way is because you really want 
uh, your error to be lowest for students in the middle because you know more there's going to be more data there in the middle of the distribution. So you want your your test to be most accurate for the most number of people. Any questions about that? Can you, can you explain that again? Can you, so for most students, they're going to fall in zeros, right? And you want your most students. Yeah, so let me, let me, let me kind of show you um, back over here at the beginning, right? So ability is normally distributed. So this is a histogram, right? So uh, over here at the top, you know, you're going to have most students are going to have ability zero, right? They're going to be kind of in the middle. And then the further you go out on the extremes, you're going to have fewer students with that ability, right? You're going to have fewer really, really good students and fewer really, really bad students, right? So I'm just trying to translate this to the test cases. Are you saying most people with the zero, so I'm thinking like normal distribution of your Virginia test, we're going to assume most people will probably fall within the 75 to 80%. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to have some group of folks really smart getting the hundreds and then some that didn't study for whatever reason get yeah. zero. So you're saying ability is the measure of people that hit 70, uh, 75% or is it being defined as something? No, ab ability is ability. You can, there's, you can map, given an ability, there, there's a straightforward formula, like using the item response function to get uh, the, you know, the predicted number of questions right. And then you can use whatever your score scale is, to translate that to a scaled score. So you can think of ability as being in a sense, your your like raw test score, right? Like kind of, right? It, it's your ability, right? Not quite, right? It's so it, it's defined as like an individual, like yeah, not, not as like the total. Or... Right, but yeah, I mean, no, nobody's going to have exactly the same ability, but there are going to, you know, they're going to be most of your students are going to have their ability closer to the center, yeah, okay. of this distribution. And the idea is that like, you know. The, the student, the 99th percentile, right? Like this test isn't designed for them, right? No. Um, so you want your error to be to be the least for the, the most number of people. Um, so one other thing uh, that I want to talk about is standard error of differences. What if you want to, uh, to get the error uh, for comparing two different test scores? So for that, you, uh, you need to account for the fact that uh, the, the error is multiplied you know, because you're talking about two different random variables. And so you can use that same thing that we talked about before that the, uh, the variance of a sum of random variables is equal to the sum of the variances. And you can get this formula for what's called the standard error of differences. And um, so one way, one kind of heuristic uh, of thinking about the reliability of a test is to think, uh, think how many non-overlapping 95% uh, score difference confidence intervals fit in the score range of a test. Um, and I'll hopefully I'll, I'll, I'll illustrate that in a second. Um, but that number is the number of distinct ability groups that the test can sort students into with 95% confidence. So I built this app, which you can scan here. So uh, I haven't spent that much time talking about standard, you know, standard errors. Hopefully we understand that it's, it's a measure of uh, you know, it's a measure of the error in your score. Okay, so uh, for instance, uh, a student uh, with that receives a, a score of 152 on the LSAT, okay, assuming that the standard error of measurement is 2.6, then their true score will be between 147 and 157 with 95% confidence, right? So this red part is like where your true score might be. All right, assuming that your actual observed score was right over here at 152. So that's the idea with the standard error of measurement. So that's what the red, the red indicate, indicates. Now, these vertical lines are the standard error of different score buckets. So the idea is that, um, you know, if you have two students whose score isn't here, then you can say more or less that they're the same score. This test cannot differentiate between those students because of the error of the test. And what I think is pretty shocking about that, I'm using real data here from the LSAT. Okay, the LSAT can only fit, it can only differ, uh, can only divide students into one, two, three, four ability groups or four, four test buckets. So you can't actually say, uh, you know, uh, 
you know, really, really like the LSAT can only say like who the very best students are, the very worst students are, and like the two groups in the middle. Okay, so you can't um, basically if, uh, you know, you and your buddy, you know, get, uh, if you get a 151 and he gets a 161, you basically got the same score. So, yes. Would there be more bands if, there, if the, each item had a higher discrimination? Uh, yeah, I think this is uh, one. So remember, higher discrimination means a lower standard error, error measurement, right? So, yes. Yeah, that's, again, that's what I was trying to illustrate over here. Okay, uh, whoops, where are we? Right, so as the discrimination goes up here on the x-axis, the error goes down. Um, so yeah, and so, you know, I kind of use it, for, I use real data for all this. So GMAT is over here, it's even worse. Uh, so you can only really uh, say that there's three types of students who take the GMAT. Um, some of the other ones are a lot better. So the GRE, uh, six bins. So you take this, the length of this 95% confidence interval. Yep. And then you see how many of those you can lay across the bottom of this. Thing exactly. Have. And does it matter if you start in the middle, start at the left, start at the right, or it doesn't what, matter? Um, I'm I'm starting. I think I'm starting on the left hand side. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. So yeah. So you know, feel free to check this app out. Well, actually, hold on. Before because we're running out of time, I just kind of want to have some some final comments on this. So um, so yeah. Prior to 2006, a law school has actually averaged your LSAT score for admissions purposes. But after 2006, there was there was a change, and so they now report uh, to the bar and use for admissions purposes your highest score. Um, so that actually encourages you to take and retake the LSAT um, until just pure luck gets you a score at the upper end of the confidence band, right? Because your score band can be up to 10 points wide, right? You can just, you know, you might have gotten pretty unlucky and gotten at the lower end of your score band. So you take and retake, you might uh, increase quite a lot without even any studying. Um, so uh, the other thing that's a little bit weird is that... Um, Test prep companies tend to report only your 68% score band because it looks better, right? It's narrower. Um, but uh, that's really not, you know, that means that your true score is only going to be, uh, you know, in that uh, in that score band 68% of the time. So it's, it's um, yeah. And the other thing is that, um, you know, anyone who claims to have a score prediction model, right, you have to take this into account. Right. So if you're on a test prep site and they're saying, well, we predict that your, your score is going to be 152, what's the score band? Right. Is that a 95% score band or a 68% score band? It's not going to be very good, you know, because they're starting with a test that isn't very accurate, you know, that isn't very reliable to begin with, at least for LSAT. Right. So again, some of these other tests are a little bit better. Um, one other thing, you know, I'd like to try and get up here. I, I um, uh, don't have it on GitHub yet, but there's some other kind of apps that I built here uh, that kind of allow you to visualize the item information function. So I'll try and get those up and um, put that on the GitHub and hopefully uh, Dana can get that out to you. But I uh, wanted to leave some time for questions. Yes. This cannot help you to determine for an exam prepare or somebody who's writing the questions for an exam. Mm -hmm. What questions you have? Because they wouldn't know the discrimination or the difficulty factors, etc. Yeah. Right. right. So I, I think I think the way this is done, at like places like EDS who write these tests, is you know they have like kind of a pilot study, right, where they design the tests and they have a bunch of students take them, then they fit the model and they see you know what are the discriminations and then they they prune the test. Um, that's how that's how I think they do it. So, but yeah, you do you do need some data to go with first. Yes. Uh, doesn't take doesn't take that into account at all. Um, you know, you could have a more sophisticated model that, like a neural network, that um, kind of uses you know an IRT model. It's just one part of it that, that does take into account count demographic information. There was um, this is kind of a, a bit tangential, but the the LSAT makers of the LSAT were recently sued by a blind person 
um, who um, basically said that the logic game section was, uh, you know, biased against blind people because it really, to answer them, you really have to draw these um, diagrams and you can't do that if you're blind. So they're planning on removing that whole section of the test. Okay. Where did you get this data for the So uh, there's, there's two data sets. One of them uh, I generated, it's synthetic data and the code for generating that is on the GitHub, um, which, um, you know, I'll get the link out to you. The other data comes from um, the data for the second plot or the third plot really comes from a 1970 paper uh, by Bach and Lieberman. So um, there is, uh, I believe at the beginning of the slideshow, I think I uh, think there's a link to the data on my Google Drive. So you can download that for yourself. Yes. It's, um, are you familiar with other use cases in business for this? For example, being used in AP testing. And all you're doing is identifying traits of the users who are creating from that. That's that's all. It's like right or wrong answer. Trying to identify uh, behavior based off the traits. So, uh, are you familiar with how it's being used in? So the, the, look, the way I would use this, you know, I'm, I'm not super familiar, but right, if I was going to use this in, in marketing, you know, I would design a questionnaire or have, you know, a psychometrician design a questionnaire. Um, and then, you know, I would use, uh, I would use IRT to, you know, try and improve that questionnaire. That's, that's how, what I would do to try and, you know, customer satisfaction survey or which product do you like best or whatever. Um, A-B testing, you know, as I understand it, right, you're trying to decide, like, you know, is there a difference between two groups? Um, and so that's kind of like what I've tried to do here with this this dashboard, right? Like, is there a difference between the two test scores of these two students? So in a way, that's kind of an A-B test, you know, in the sense that you're, you're saying, is the difference between these two students statistically significant? Yes. Is the model based on the whole test, or is it question by question basis? Is the model based on the whole test, like based like a test of two questions, or is it based on like one question or not It it's really the the unit the unit is the question, right? So um, you know, uh, you could, you know, um, you know, you um. I'm not, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, what? Uh, let's say if uh, I'm only using these two, I'm sorry, I don't know. So let's say if uh, you have like a test, it has like a 200 questions. Uh -huh. That 200 questions is taken out from like a 2,000 question bank. So is this model based on the whole like a 200 test or is like a per question based? Yeah, no, it, it's, um. you get, you get a, a set of, item parameters, right? So there's one thing I actually did uh, for a company where um, I fit a bunch of IRT models. Um, they had a bunch of practice tests and you know those practice tests always had the same questions on them. Um, but um, I wanted to really understand how students were improving over time. And so what I did was I just uh, looked at all the questions that they were taking and a particular, like their first 100 questions followed by the next 100 questions followed by the next one. And I fit an IRT model for each bag of questions and looked at how their ability was changing over time. So those questions, you know, all came from a test, but I looked at them independent of what tests they came from. I just looked at what were the first 100 questions. And to me, that was kind of like a test. So but the point is you can shuffle things around because the unit of study is the item, not the test. Yes. In terms of um, business case, right? Would something like this be helpful for when companies do like uh, questionnaires for new hires, like Hacker Rank, right? Mm -hmm. Be able to kind of just create questions and whatnot, pose them to new hires, even in interns, right? Would mm -hmm. something like this be helpful to kind of derive those questions? Uh, maybe not to derive them, but once you've written the questions, to see which ones are more informative and which ones are less informative, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, yes. No, no, no. Is there any data we find example take from one of the point, right? So if the perspective is from an example take, do I get any takeaways from this? 
by which I can prepare to take things guessing for myself. So what what you should do is um, maybe not to, well okay maybe maybe yes to prepare for the exam if you have taken a practice test right um, and you know uh, let's say your goal score is 160 right that's your goal score and you're you've taken a practice test and you got 160. Uh, I'm sorry what, what did I say I said a goal score is 160 let's say you got 155 so you're five points shy. You should look at the standard error measurement of the test, right? Because if your goal score, right, is only five points away from your actual the score you got, and the standard error measurement of the test, you know, is two point five, right? That means that you're going to have a score band of like ten points. So you shouldn't bother studying, in my opinion. You should retake the test and see if you get your goal score. When it comes to K twelve education, do you know how districts or teachers are using data from like fast testing, which is you know FSA or EOC courses? I feel like um, just coming from a K twelve education background, that we have a very basic, you know, understanding of using these statistics to guide our instruction. Um, you know, districts are going to kind of be moving towards things like this. I, I think I think to some extent, yeah. I, in a lot of cases, you know, are you familiar, familiar? Are you familiar with the map growth test? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I actually actually had had a conversation with the people who make that test, and they they have psychometricians, um, so they are using IRT to help them make map growth tests better. Um, you know, there is IRT software that you don't need to be a data scientist or a coder to to use. So, um, you know, and you could, you know, uh, I don't, don't know exactly how you'd go about doing this, but, you know, if you bug your principal or the, you know, school district uh, people would say, hey, you know, can you, can you get a copy of the software for the teachers? Because, you know, as, you know, teachers, uh, if there's like a test that you give every year, year after year, it might be worth doing an IRT analysis on it to see if some of those questions need to be dropped. Um, and, uh, you know, as long as you're willing to take that data and plug it in, and you can you can get an IRT analysis done with you know not being an expert in this. There's software out there. So what would like you just said like um, using an IRT test to determine whether a question needs to be dropped? What would be like a determining factor of like dropping a question? Would it be because it's too ambiguous? Would it be because like it's not descriptive enough? What characters of usage? Of like why or why question you can drop after an IRT test. So an IRT analysis can't tell you why, like you know, but what it can tell you is you know which questions should you look at closer. So if you have uh you know if most of the items on your test have a discrimination of let's say three, and you get one that's got a discrimination of like 0.1, then I would look at that question and you know uh, a little bit closer because it could be that there is something. Uh, it could be that that's a badly worded question. Maybe there's a typo or something that's causing, you know, uh, essentially uh, you to get random responses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to make a comment that it has to, like, IRT has more to do with the internal integrity of the test. I think there's like some confusion that it doesn't have to do with external validity at all. So like what it really means. It's purely does that question, how much does that question contribute to the overall score or what you think you're testing? And yeah, so that's like it doesn't tell you very it doesn't tell you anything about what how that relates to any external validity. Yeah, it's just like it also the variability. Yeah, you still need to test whether someone's score is correlated with the success of if it's like school, their success, right? School. Right. So I guess what just made you ask more questions a little bit to kind of dig deeper into like, is it a student, is it a test, or is it kind of that kind of thing? Right. Mm -hmm. But definitely, but it's still useful, yeah. Like if you're using it to hire people right. and you find out this isn't discriminating between people, then you know. In some ways, it doesn't matter why, <laughs> except for making a better question. Right. So, but yeah, you definitely, there's no reason in giving people questions, right? Sure. Giving no 
discrimination between good candidates and bad candidates. Yes. Yeah, that's a question. Uh, first one is uh, as far as the applicability of this, right? You have, you kind of touch on this where it's like it's a feature like the student state test like the year, and like you know, it's like you have a lot of data that we feed into it and uh, you have a negative score coming out of it, right? Um, but I guess like the biggest hurdle for it is uh, right, having enough sample, a big enough sample size to actually develop like a full uh, uh, like the bird on like, you know, whatever the, like, the, the Right, like at the uh, the hierarchy scores. Um, have you seen like a you know like what a good number is for that? Because like we're also talking about you know if you were using it like the higher candidates, but it's like if you're like a mid sized firm where it's like you know you see maybe like 10, 15 candidates and like this test scores all change, right? It's over oh, that's right. Like the questions that you're asking change. It's like you're not going to have the data for that. So it's bigger for like some of the next testing where they have you know, a much larger sample size. Yeah. Um. I mean, you you probably want more than like three three people taking the test but uh you don't actually need um that uh, that big of a sample for IRT. 100 is really uh really good enough so yeah mm -hmm. and, uh, the other thing was uh, this is maybe a dumb question but uh, when you had your uh the mean standard uh the mean standard average across um it was uh showing like on the betas and like you know like where like you know the minimum is it was actually like a little bit of like a guy a little bit of a higher beta, and I didn't notice there was no like beta, uh, no data point for where beta was zero. Is that just because like beta was like just randomly distributed, like for which which plot are we talking about? Yeah. Talking about this one? Yeah. What was the question? So, uh, like, I guess um, like they they just the measure of uh like a, uh, uh someone's ability, right? Yes. Yeah, a big ability level. So there's no uh, there's, like uh, there's no. This is just a small sample. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is, um, you know, they did, did this in 1970. So those, those data, those dots are individual students, right? So you can see there's like, I don't know, 15 there or something. It's just a small sample size. Um, so, but you could see where, where, th where it would be, right? I mean, yeah. Can, yeah. Um, and, and, you know, so this app I built, which this one isn't, um, this one isn't up yet. Uh, this is just on my local machine. But I mean, you can kind of see how the how the curve changes um, with increasing discrimination, right? So it's it's always you know pretty parabolic, um, kind of how it shifts. So um, yeah, you you expect that it, it would be where you where you think it would be. Right. Yeah. Quick question for like the sample questions is that why like a lot of we have standardized tests they like put like a uh, X percentage of questions aren't. Rated, but they're just using that as like a sample. So like, that's what I know people excited for the PMP certification. They're like maybe like ten questions that aren't rated, but they're just used for like sampling. Purposes. Oh yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Um. Good point. Yeah. So I think you're talking about like the experimental yeah. sections when you take these standardized tests. There's a question. There's a section that that doesn't count to your score. Um. So yeah. Uh, that's I think somebody else uh, raised a question about that. You know, how do you how do you get the, the IRT parameters? So yeah, if you're one of these big testing companies and you can force people to take an experimental section um, and they don't know that it's not real, so they have to take it, then that's one way you can you can get those IRT parameters. Um, we talked about doing that at, at um, one of the companies I worked at actually um, to to kind of test out new questions. Yeah. All right. Let's um, let's thank for the.